Right, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to those here and welcome to those who are looking in online. Um, just a few notices before we start. Our uh, December meeting will be a lecture from Professor Sean Paling all about the work searching for dark matter down Bulby Mine. Uh, that's on Tuesday, December the 5th, and that'll be at Middlesbrough College. Our January lecture is all about fluid dynamics. Uh, a gentleman from Leeds University called Peter Jimak. Uh, that will be here again at Teesside University. On Tuesday, January the 23rd, uh, we have a visit to the Materials Processing Institute to see the Liberty Powder Metals pilot plant uh, and the Powder Characterization lab, lab. That's an afternoon visit at two o'clock. Anybody who'd like to go, please get in touch with me. Right, uh, now then, I think uh, we're ready to introduce Hallam Wheatley from Glass Futures. Uh, if Tony, if you could do the magic on here. Just can we ask, uh, Steve, is it all coming through all right on the, uh, on the WebEx? Yes, it is, Tony. Fine, fine here. Yeah, fine. fine. Thank you. Right, you've all been muted again, so we don't need any uh, doorbells or chiming clocks or anything. Right, you should all be able to see uh, Alan Wheatley's presentation now. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. over to you if you'd thank like you. to uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Absolutely, first. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for having me today as well. I realise today is National Engineers Day in the UK. I found that out this morning. Didn't know that was a thing, but so it is. So, um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and I'm delighted to talk to you about two of my favourite things, innovation and collaboration. I don't know if it's going to be as intriguing as dark matter, but I'll try my best. Um, I do have a slight confession to make. When I was asked to come to the Cleveland Institute of Engineers, um, I'm not an engineer. I'm a chemist by training. I know. I can't believe I've not been struck down as I kind of walked in. But... I am delighted to be here, um, and I think you know what I'm going to talk about today is 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 what the work glass futures are trying to do, and and how we're trying to bring not just the glass industry but you know heavy industry together, and kind of demonstrate that through collaboration that's the the best way that we're going to be able to to innovate and certainly achieve some of these sustainability targets that are being set. Um, so before I start, just a little bit about me. Um, so I'm, I'm a Teesider through and through. I grew up just down the road. I live in Martin, so just straight down Martin Road. Um, I'm a product of Teesside. I grew up in Saltburn, went to college in Gisborough, and then studied here eventually. Um, but I call myself an unconventional apprentice. So I started uh, my apprenticeship at 18. So I did my A-levels and then decided that university at the time wasn't for me. So I started my apprenticeship in laboratory-based techniques at a company called Lottie Chemical, which was based on the Wilton site, which is now Alpec Polyester. Um, had a great time there, had some fantastic tutors and fantastic teachings. And I truly believe that that apprenticeship set me up to have the career that I've had so far. Um, without it, I wouldn't have been here doing what I'm doing now. In 2014, I moved to Sabic. Um, I was at Sabic for nearly nine fantastic years. Um, I had varying different roles in manufacturing. So manufacturing chemist on Olefin 6, which is the cracker based at Wilton. I then moved into R&D and started working in a, a global role for Sabic before moving into the deep dark world of the commercial side of things, which is kind of what I'm doing now. Don't worry, this isn't a sales pitch. The commission that I would charge Glass Futures for post 5 p.m. sales is far too high for a not-for-profit. Um, anyway. <laughs> in December of last year, I joined Glass Futures, and I know nothing about glass. I know a little bit now, but I still really know nothing about glass. My kind of history and, and my background is in chemistry, and specifically olefin chemistry. If it goes over a benzene ring size, I don't really want to know. It's too much for me, too many curly arrows. Um, but what excited me about the opportunity for Glass Futures was what they're trying to achieve by bringing people together. And when we talk about open innovation, it's quite a new concept um, and what Glass Futures are trying to do, and I'm kind of hopefully going to demonstrate that through this presentation, is together is the only way. 
And that's what excited me. And I kind of truly believe that if glass futures get half of what they're trying to achieve right, they're going to change the face of innovation, not just in the glass industry, but across heavy industry. So I'm going to use the term foundation industries a few times through this presentation. Are we aware of what the foundation industries is? You heard that term before. So that's a, a UKRI term that was um, very nicely coined by the wonderful people at UKRI to kind of glam up the heavy industry. So the foundation industries is chemicals, glass, paper, ceramics, metals, and concrete. I got them all right first time. I normally always forget one. You good? So, who are Glass Futures? So, Glass Futures is a not-for-profit organisation. The site that you've just seen is based in St Helens in the northwest, right between Manchester and Liverpool. And we're a not-for-profit, membership-based organisation. Not-for-profit is the important piece. We have to be. The strategy of what Glass Futures is trying to do doesn't work if the shareholders above us. You know, we're for the industry, by the industry. We were built out of a need. So, the conversations about Glass Futures started probably about 10 years ago. But the economics for what we're trying to do weren't there. Fast forward to 2019, 2020, those discussions became more and more. And through the Trade Association British Glass, Glass Futures as a concept was really formed. And we got our first employees and we built up since then. We're an RTO, which is a really, really important point. By being an RTO, it means we can leverage both public and private money. And a lot of what you're going to see here has been backed by government through grant funds, through UKRI but also through our membership. I'm going to talk about the membership at the end. Don't worry, this isn't a sales pitch, I promise. But what we're trying to do is not have a site in St. Helens. We want a global reach. And everything that we're trying to do needs to be applicable to the global glass industry, but as well as the global foundation industries. Our mission, when I talk about it, the way I describe this, the best way to think about it, decarbonisation and being sustainable, it's a really difficult difficult task for any organization. I don't believe that companies should do it alone. I think in the climate we're in, I think the challenges that we're trying to face, there is no point in trying to tackle it alone. So we believe that by doing it collaboratively, by doing it together, it's not only going to split the cost, but it's also going to spread the risk. You can reduce that risk. Brilliant. Demonstrating disruptive technologies. Now the glass industry, like most heavy industries, is risk averse. It's risk averse because the assets that they have cost so much money to run, so much money to build. Throwing research at these on a kind of big scale is scary. I get that. And having somewhere where we can demonstrate disruptive technologies on a big scale, it's really important. And what I think Glass Futures is trying to do is show that it can be done. And by doing that, we've used the word supply chain here to consumer. For me, that whole thing is the value chain and ensuring the whole value chain can get benefit from this is really, really important. And like we say, we believe that a sustainable future can be enabled by glass. I'll never forget my mum when I said that I was leaving Sabic to join Glass Futures. She said, what future does glass have? T-Sider. I'm sat there leaving this big established organisation like Sabic. They sent me all over the world. I'd spent three years living in Holland. It was fantastic. My mum goes, what are you doing, joining a not-for-profit company? That What's glass got? My answer is without glass futures, the future of glass looks pretty bleak. I didn't, I've just made that up on the spot. I'm going to use that in a sales pitch. So when I talk about TRLs, have you come across TRLs before? Yeah. So when we talk about technical readiness levels, you know, in the UK, as much as many places, what we find is academia and industry, they spend quite a lot of money on the kind of each end of the spectrum. I got told off by a professor yesterday of showing this slide. He said the TRL level it is much more collaborative than that. And this is a really simplified linear version. But essentially what I'm kind of trying to demonstrate here is that this valley of death in the kind of mid TRL range, we find that academia partner with industry at the lowest level to demonstrate these really wacky technologies that are probably 20, 30 years away from commercialization. And then on the other end, industry, they invest in what's commercially there. You know, I worked for Sabic for nearly nine years, kind of investing in commercial scale, things like that was common for investing in the lower TRL stuff. They just wouldn't do it. It was too risky, too risky to the asset. So we needed something that can help plug that gap. And that's what Glass Futures is trying to do. And that's what we did. So we designed a pilot facility in St. Helens that essentially is going to be a glass plant. 
And I think when we look, and you know, speaking earlier, we were talking about a brand new company in the UK building an asset of this size. I don't think it's been seen for a long time. Um, and what we're trying to do is build this facility that members can come to and look at and see demonstrable techniques and technology. So we're building a glass furnace. I'm going to show you the furnace later. But what we've tried to do is build this space where understanding the nuances of the industry, we can really put something there that the whole industry can recognize. This isn't going to be state of the art. I think it would be foolish to build something state of the art that members look at and go, okay, that's great. We'll see it in 20 years. We want them to look at it and go, okay, we can do that now. We can do that in our next iteration of our furnace. So for kind of reference here, conventional glass furnaces, they're built, they're turned on, and they're on for 15, 20 years. No change, 24 seven, 1400 degrees, it's running. So doing research on these assets is very difficult. And also you find people don't want to do it. They don't want to risk breaking their furnace. It's understandable. Having somewhere where they can do that, that becomes really, really advantageous to our membership. So I think when we look at low carbon fuels, I'm going to talk about that quite a bit today. 80% of the carbon footprint of glass production is in the fuel. So if we can get lower carbon fuel, it's going to be really, really beneficial to the whole glass industry. The three main types, and I know there are more, and if there's people listening who kind of know that, I apologize, but three main types of glass manufacturing, certainly here in the UK, we have container, glass balls, glass jars, that kind of thing. We have float manufacturing, windows, and then we have fiber, glass insulation. They're the three main types. Now, if there's glass manufacturers on, they're gonna to shout at me, but essentially the way that the glass is melted and the raw materials are melted, it's kind of the same. We have different iterations of furnaces, the way they work is slightly different, but ultimately, you know, we're throwing raw material in and we're heating it up. The cold end part differs slightly. So we've designed the building itself to be able to accommodate those three different types so that the whole value chain can get benefit. So we designed a furnace. So, when we design this, the whole important aspect of this furnace is that the whole value chain has a say. So we've designed a flexible oxy-fire fuel system for a furnace. Now these aren't like uber common in the glass industry, but for the scale that we were doing, it made sense. And I think one of the things that we've looked at is as people move towards hydrogen, we expect oxy-fire furnaces blending with hydrogen will probably be the way they go. But what we're trying to do here is demonstrate on a system where we can use blends of different fuels. So not just hydrogen, but you know, we can use oxygen and natural gas, oxygen and biofuel, hydrogen and oxygen, and blends of all of them, as well as electric boosting. So we've designed a furnace with whole input from the whole glass industry. Now, when we look at the, the way a furnace is built, we have the refractory organizations who build the bricks that kind of house the glass. One of the things we wanted to do, and it, this actually came from one of our float members, was we designed this refractory test pocket. Now, this is a really good example of collaboration and what we're trying to do. So this test pocket here that you can see, we can isolate this, we can swap the bricks out, we can put different materials in. Um, the flat bottom design that you can see in the furnace is, is quite unique. We've done that so that we can drain the furnace from glass. So if we want to take things out and trial it, the idea being here that we're going to entice people to come in and collaborate with us and innovate for the whole glass industry. So what we've got, this is the kind of end, this, this picture flips for some weird and wonderful reason. But what happens here, this is where the feed of the raw material comes in. Now, when we spoke with both container and float manufacturers and fiber manufacturers, what we found the container manufacturers, they don't really care how the batch goes in. You know, they tend to feed it in from the side and they just shove it in. You don't really care. The float manufacturers who make the windows, it's a lot, they're a lot more critical on how the batch is mixed and how it's put in. So what we did is we designed a rear fed furnace that suits the float manufacturers because the container manufacturers don't care. But then when we looked at the boost system, what we decided is to go with something that suits everyone. So these red dots that you can see here, these are for the boost. Now we put boost in the furnace. What that allows is it allows the convection for the glass to mix and melt more uniformly. So what you get is you get hot glass around the electrodes that makes it rise, that causes a convection that goes around. 
we can run up to 80% boost. That's really high. Most of the glass industry runs at five to 10%. And I've got a demonstrated project that we're doing at the minute that collaborates with government as well as industrial partners to, to see why we want to go to 80%. But what we'll find, I'm sure, is that we'll get to a point where convection stops and the melt becomes more inefficient. So we need to kind of work with industry on that one. The furnace is then kind of, uh, sorry, the melt runs through there, it goes up here, feeds in here, and then feeds out into the fore half here. So when we look at the fore half, which is this wonderful thing here, the fore half, what the fore half's purpose is, for people who might not know, it's to kind of get the glass at a uniform temperature. So that's when it goes on to its forming phase. We use the fore half that kind of allows the glass to settle, get to the steady temperature across the melt, and makes better forming. We've got three drains here. So you can see one here, two here, and a third potential here. So we've got plans for this to potentially put something in around glass fiber, but nothing set in stone yet. From day one of operation, we're gonna use this four half, which is gonna roll the glass out onto a roll plate line. That's then gonna run down. We've got the roll plate line where we can cut the glass. The reason we've gone with roll plate line is, which isn't conventionally used in the glass industry today, but it allows us to cut the glass and analyze the glass. We're more interested for this iteration of the furnace in the heating side of things. And then what happens after? This one is for an IS machine. So an IS machine, or uh, I can't remember what IS stands for, I've forgotten, but it's for glass bottles, essentially. It's a container side of things. So you can switch the gobs out, you can change them in so we can do some wonderful bottle designs. But we've designed this four half so that we can, it's quite modular, we can put things in. So we could do some late change formulation changes, which is quite exciting. So essentially, if we wanted to do something with a glass melt, we wouldn't have to do 30 tons a day. We could add something in here. So if we wanted to do color changes or things like that. So the whole industry can get some benefit from this. And that's how we try to design it. So we designed it. We had to build it. We did. So I started in December of last year and this had just, I think it had just had the roof put on. Kind of fast forward 11 months, we have a fully functioning site with a furnace that's currently being built. So the building itself opened in April. This is our office space, which has two floors of um, fully kitted out office space, which is fantastic to see, you know, company that when I started had just over 40 people. Plan is by June next year, it's gonna have nearly a hundred. Quite exciting for some size and scale. Um, St. Helens Stadium, current world champions, I don't think for much longer. Um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so you can see the sheer size and scale. So what we've got here, this is the batch house, um, where the raw materials are all going to get mixed and stored. We've designed the batch house big on purpose, because one of the things when we look at, and you'll see it later, the raw materials used in glass are another contribution for the carbon dioxide emissions. So when we have carbonate material, obviously, as we burn it, it emits CO2, could we use carbonate free materials? That's one of the things that we're investigating. We're working with academics across the globe to look at that um, those kind of developments. This is where the furnace is gonna live in this space here. And it's gonna kind of, the cold inside here is where we're gonna process the glass. We've built the building big specifically so it can grow. It can grow with the needs of the industry. We've not built the building around the furnace. We're kind of building it as an iteration to grow. So if you look inside, so you can see the steelwork's gone in. This is a pretty um, important milestone for us, getting this, this in. And um, the furnace will kind of live in this space here that you can see. The fore half will come out at the top here. It'll drain into here, which is, this is where the IS machine is gonna go. This is the third spare drain that we may try and use for glass fiber. And then this side is where the roll plate line is going to go. Um, we have space for lap here that we can kit out. And then this space, this is our project space. And when I say that we've built it to grow, I really mean it. This space can house not just individual pieces of kit, but potentially, should we want to, um, a bigger furnace. So I think at this point, it's important to, to understand the conventional glass furnace lasts 15 to 20 years. That's the ideal run length. It's the ideal to get maximum you know, glass out um, and they're running some of them, you know, 
800 tons a day, massive scale. You know, we're only running 30 tons, but we're confident that 30 tons is enough to demonstrate an industrial impact. Um, in kind of doing this, what we're trying to do, we're going to run this for three to five years. We're going to absolutely hammer it. We want by the end of it, it to be on its knees. And I think, you know, I'm of the opinion that when we build the next furnace, if we build the same furnace, we've failed. We want to throw so much at this demonstrable impact around different fuels. You know, if we're putting hydrogen in, what, what impact is hydrogen going to have on the glass? It's a really important point. I'm going to show you what we've done on that space. But, you know, does it have an impact on the refractories? What type of different materials, what impact do they have? So the second iteration of the furnace that we're going to build in, you know, 2026, 2027, that kind of thing. What's that going to look like? Is it going to be bigger? We've built the building so that we can, and we've got this space here that we can grow into, um, which again is really important as we move forward. This is the batch plant. So you can see these are essentially big mixers that mix the, um, the batch as it comes in. We've got different size silos that you can see with the conveyor belts. This is the uh, conveyor belt leading into the furnace or, or where it'll go. So you can see we're, we're quite close to, to getting there, which is quite exciting. The refractory bricks, they're all made, ready to go in, um, which is, again, another big milestone that we needed to hit. Um, our intention is that we have glass out in June next year, so we've got quite a way to go still, but these big milestones that we're hitting are really important for us to ensure that we get there. Again, this is the test pocket that I mentioned, so this can be isolated and drained separately and these bricks changed out. We've got, I believe we've got four um, refractory manufacturers on our membership, I'll show you our membership later. Um, but again, this is about collaborating with the whole value chain in glass. It's a really important point of what we're trying to do. So I think it would have been very easy for Glass Futures to take membership money, to take government money and say, right, we'll see you in 2024 when we've got a furnace. We didn't want to do that. And I think it's important that we didn't do that. And one of the things that we've really tried to do is, is use our, you know, the fact that we're an RTO to ensure that we can add value now. Add value to our membership right now. So what we did is we worked with our stakeholders. And again, I think this is a really important point. We're not here to decarbonize the glass or the foundation industry. We're here to help member companies on their journey. We're not here to say, this is the solution. We're here to say, these are potential solutions for you. So we sat down and worked with the glass manufacturers, but also other foundation industry stakeholders and said, what are the six key areas that are going to help be sustainable. And we decided low carbon fuels, carbon capture, increased recycling, waste heat recovery, industry 4.0, and new raw materials and batch composition. Now, you can take them and put them in any of the foundation industries and they're the same. And that's why it's important that, that we do that. So, how did we do it? Well, we actually did a project with Baines a few years back, which gave us a £7 million grant, which allowed us to build this piece of kit. So this is our combustion test bed, and this lives in Sheffield at the moment, um, in an old Liberty Seal site. Um, this is going to move to St. Helens um, at some point this year, maybe next year. But this has allowed us on the alternative fuel side to do tons of testing already. So what we've done is we've been able to, to build and develop some, in partnership some burner technology. We've been able to demonstrate you know, the firing of natural gas hydrogen, biofuels, but also blends of them. And what we've been able to do is, you know, certainly on the, um, if you look at the value chain and, and the people, the service providers inside, camera developers, they've used our rig to um, look for hydrogen flames. Obviously, it's quite hard to detect hydrogen, as we know. Hello. Yeah. Um, and we've used this, 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 this works enabled us to do studies on, on certainly biofuels, which I'll come on to later, that, that have really demonstrated that collaborative impact. This kit is there for use for our members, and it will still be there. It's been great for the refractory piece, but what we've also been able to demonstrate here, whilst we call Glass Futures, we're here to help other industries as well. So we did a 100% hydrogen trial for the ceramics industry, and we've got some work coming up with the BCC, which is the British Ceramic Confederation. Um, and the pilot line is kind of looking at doing more hydrogen trials moving forward. Um, so this is the type of work we did. We also did some work in the steels industry with our CTB. Um, 
Again, there's some nice pictures of the hydrogen flame where you can't see it with the hot background. Um, so we were able to do lots of different tests with the steel industry there. Again, I keep saying I don't know much about glass. I know very little, even less about steel. So I'm not going to spend too much on it. But I wanted to demonstrate that this is a collaborative effort across the foundation industries. So how do we do it? This is the important point. Glass Futures is a medium. We're, we're here to help collaborate. We're here to help the industries collaborate. And I think my job as the collaboration lead within Glass Futures is to be the external arm. So I look after our membership and the BD, and it's about ensuring that the projects that they want us to work on are being worked on. And if member A is saying, look, I really need hydrogen, I know that member C, D, they're also saying the same. So bringing them in the room together in a pre-competitive space is really important. And this is what I've seen. This is why I joined Glass Futures. You know, when I look at the whole membership and the spread of it, seeing people coming together to collaborate, I didn't see much of it in the chemical industry. I think, I hope it's changing. I saw joint ventures, don't get me wrong, but in terms of this space, I think it's, it's really exciting to see members sitting down and kind of understanding that if we're to achieve the aims of not just you know ourselves our suppliers but also government we need to collaborate so this is a very simplified slide about the process of how we do it so what we needed to do is look at what can we do internally you know the worst thing we could do is over promise over promising and under delivering are the worst things that we can do so we needed to, to ensure we knew our core competent areas ensure where we're strong we let people know the member engagement side has been you know, what I've been working on over the last kind of 11 months, understanding how um, the needs of our membership can be met. Look at the technical scoping. What can we deliver? You know, so we know what they want. Can we do it? How, if they want it, how can we do it? It's, it's those conversations that we're trying to have, as well as the finalization of the plans, working together on fully costed programs, scheduling them, and then leveraging the funding from members with government money and then bringing it all together in a package. Now, by being an RTO, it helps, but it also makes it more complicated, but it's one of the most exciting aspects of what we did. So what we did, we sat down and thought, right, where are we strong? Where can Glass Futures add value? And these were the kind of six key areas that we looked at. You know, we know these are all areas that are of interest. What can Glass Futures do to support? So we put this list together, and then what we did is we put a plan there to engage with members. So this was about engaging with the whole membership. So this is including brands, this is including service providers who have nothing, you know, no experience in the glass industry other than providing, you know, whether it's burners or whatever, right through to the glass manufacturers. And we sat down one-to-one -one with them over a three-month period and went through this and said, where are the areas of interest? Where do you need help in developing? And what we did is we found out the short and medium term priority areas for these people. Now, I've already mentioned 80% of the carbon footprint of a glass bottle comes from the fuel. No shock that fuel and combustion were the kind of key areas in the short and medium term. How can glass futures help over the next three to five years? It's fuels and combustion. So these were kind of, what are they asking for? So it's the alternative fuels, the impact on refractories, emissions, waste heat recovery. You know, I've mentioned, we use hydrogen, what impact does that have? Does it have an impact on the glass? You know, biofuels, what impact does it have? I'm a chemist, if it's got carbon and hydrogen, it's gonna burn, but what impact is it gonna have, you know, on equipment, capex, what investment's needed? Raw materials, composition and batch, these were the kind of second and third areas that we looked at. And kind of, when we talk about the control monitoring modeling, um, this is a really important point. You know, a lot of these glass plants have been you know, had things added to them over time. Glass Futures is trying to develop a kind of nose to tail um, monitoring like software. So we're working very closely with Siemens that's allowing us to kind of ensure that we collect all the right data with all the right spots. I think one of the things, and it's probably similar across different industries, when you talk to organizations, what data do you collect? You find ones who say they collect everything and don't know what to do with it. And then you find ones who collect nothing because they don't know what to do with it. Common challenge that we've got. So we're working very closely. We've got a fantastic team of process control engineers building open source software that's going to help the modeling side of things in these glass plants. Now, I think long term, that's going to be one of the biggest areas for glass futures that's going to help our members significantly.
Longer term focus, we're obviously looking at batch charging and pattern control, how we can charge a batch before it goes into the furnace, how we can ensure the correct moisture content. It's these kind of things that are going to have more impact as we move forward. But ultimately, I don't know why you can't see that. I'm going to hide that so you can read it. I didn't see that. Sorry, everyone. Um, you know, understanding at this point how that affects the batch moving forward. Now, there's obviously there's been tons of work gone on in the background in this kind of area, but ultimately, you know, these organisations have been feeding their batches for, you know, decades the same way. Their focus is on the kind of the, the big picture stuff. Longer term these kind of things are probably going to have a bigger impact than we all realize. But for the members, it's a case of, right, we can work with academia on this kind of space. And it's important that, you know, as glass futures, we integrate with academia. You know, that whole TRL piece, we have to. It doesn't work if we don't. And then training. Obviously, there's no point building all this capability if we can't do something with it. So, for instance, hydrogen is a really good example. Having hydrogen on site getting it in, piping it in. We're going to build up all that knowledge. If we keep hold of that, we've failed as a business. We need to be telling our members how we did it. Yes, they're going to need more of it because their sites are bigger than ours, but it's all scalable. You know, we're going through those problems now so that in five, 10 years, when they go through it, we can be there to help. So alternative fuels, the big one, the kind of the first area of impact. And this is kind of what, as an organization, we, we know the first kind of probably 18 months of our furnace, it's going to be spent looking at alternative fuels. This is a big area for the glass industry. This is where we need to collaborate. So already to date, we've raised 26 million pound in funding from private and public um, to fund eight different projects across the low, um, yeah, across the low carbon fuel space. The three areas are obviously hydrogen, biofuels and electric. If we look at hydrogen, you know, we've done work on the CTB. Um, our next phase is to run hydrogen trials at St. Helens. You know, we've got the capability to run zero to 100% hydrogen. We've got the contracts in place to get that sorted, bust into site. We're having discussions at the moment about building on-site hydrogen generation. It's an interesting discussion, and it's certainly not a cheap one, as you can imagine, but it's those kind of projects that it just makes sense for glass futures to be a demonstrator for. We want to really support our members in those industrial scale hydrogen trials. And we've got a project on well, about to kick off with the BCC using the IFS. IFS is industrial fuel switching, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know. And these are some of the projects we've got. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, hydrogen on a furnace, kind of, as a chemist, it makes sense. You know, it's, it's going to burn, you're going to get the heat, it's going to melt. But, but what does the flame do? What's the heat transfer like of hydrogen? How's it going to affect the batch melting? What impact is it going to have on the refractory? You know, we know there's sodium in there. What sodium hydroxide comes out potentially? How's it all going to look? What impact is it going to have on the refractories? Is it going to create more water levels? I know you need five times more gas in a furnace if it's hydrogen powered than if it's natural gas. So what's that flow going to do? Is it going to, you know, distribute the, I don't know, heat transfer? You know, is it going to blow the batch everywhere? Is it going to cause inefficient melts? That's what Glass Futures is here to demonstrate. And that's, that's what I really love about this project. When we look at electric, this is a really good example of, you know, not just cross membership, but also cross government examples of what we can do. So obviously electric boosting, the more electric boosting we get, the more efficient the melting is. Um, I think that, I, I can't remember, it's about 80% more efficient using electric. There are electric furnaces in the world. The problem you've got with electric furnaces for, for big manufacturers is they can't scale up. You struggle getting the scale that, you know, the likes of a company like Encirc who make, you know, millions of glass bottles a day. They, they, the size of what they've got, it's, it's essentially called crown top melting where it kind of batches fed in from the top and the electric heat kind of from the bottom, it melts that way. It's hard to scale up. So what we're looking at is super boost. And this project, is, it's called Rad Electric with the industrial fuel switching. And essentially, what we're looking at doing is using the furnace as a bit of a heat battery. So if the glass industry in the UK switches to higher boost, like I said, 5 to 10% is kind of what they're using now. If that goes up, obviously the demand on the grid is going to be pretty intense. So how is it going to look if we could do it where at low demand times, 
you can raise the furnace boost up and then at high demand times you drop it down. Those quick switches, how does it work? That's what Glass Futures are trying to do. We're demonstrating that in the Rad Electric project with one of our um, founding members. Uh, I'm sure it's mentioned online, but I won't mention them just to be safe. But yeah, one of our founding members has been an integral part of that project. We've all come together. We've bid in for the IFS piece and we've been successful in that. So both ourselves and the founding member, they've got funding from the government and there's a lot of interest in this project. I think it's a really great example of how industry and government can collaborate through the medium of glass futures. Really excites me. Biofuels, the big one. So we've done tons of biofuel trials and I'm going to show you in a minute. But ultimately, one of the things that we've looked at, again, biofuels, going back, chemists, hydrogen and carbon, it's going to burn. The problem is some biofuels have, you know, they have different viscosities to kind of conventional fuel or different calorific values. So what's needed at these glass plants to take that? What we find is the higher cost fuel tends to be easy. You can pretty much put it straight in. Um, the lower cost ones, what happens there? Do we need to heat them, preheat them? The problem you've got in the glass industry is a lot of them have taken preheaters out over the last two decades, which is a bit annoying because the biofuel works better when it's preheated in some cases. How do we look at it? What about the, ass uh, the assessment of them? If it's direct competition with the food chain, you kind of, it's not a good look. So we've got to kind of, we're doing a lot of work on that. But one of the things that we did on our CTB is we tested some biofuels. Um, and from those trials, from the £7 million grant, what we did is we worked with both ENSA, who make glass bottles, and NSG, who make float glass, and we were very successful um, with our trial on the CTB, which enabled both ENSA and the NSG to get a lot of funding that was used on both capital investment, but also buying the fuel. Um, and ENSA were able to run for three weeks on 100% biofuel without any fault. Um, they made 165,000 bottles of black and white whiskey, and I think it was a million Carlsberg bottles. And I believe it was the lowest embodied carbon bottles made in the UK. NSG on a float line ran for four days and made 165,000 square meters of float glass, which had 40% less embodied carbon in it than normal. And again, that was the first of its kind trial in the world. We were able to do all this without a furnace. That you know, it's testament to my colleagues at Glass Futures who made this happen. So, demonstrating the impact. You know, we've worked very closely with industrial bodies across um, the UK, not just in glass, but further afield. We've done tons of work with government, and we had a key stand at COP, this off one of the collaborations that we had with the biofuels. Obviously, we work with ENSA, but we also work with one of the big brands, and, you know, they got quite a lot of first mover publicity from that been great on a, on a more local level um you know i'm a tea cider through and through i've spent a lot of time in st helens over the last year I've grown a big soft spot for st helens it's very much like tea side in a, in a way it's had you know lots of industry shut down over the last two years two decades um and what we've been able to do with glass futures is really kind of reinvigorate investment into that you know we've spearheaded some of the uh, investment within the town's fund to St. Helens, and then kind of the wider Liverpool city region, the strategy around the hydrogen, Glass Futures is gonna play a really big part in the high net network within Liverpool. Um, again, really exciting to be a part of, and there's a lot of buzz around what Glass Futures is trying to do. I've mentioned the Siemens uh, kit that we're working on. So we're working on the PCS Neo, which is their new process control system. We're putting the first of its kind in the glass industry into glass futures. We've been working with Siemens pretty much since the start, demonstrating that kind of process control technology, but then internally building this open source software that our members are going to have access to that's going to allow them to hopefully do predictive modeling for their glass furnace. Currently, that's really difficult. Um, you know, what you find is you've got process control for the four hearths, one for the batch, one for the furnace. And it's just by design how that is. So if Glass Futures can demonstrate the data that needs taking and how to use it, that's going to have a benefit. We're also going international, kind of. You can see me there doing my spiel in India. Um, we're looking at international research across the US, India, Japan, and Australia. We've had lots of interest from these regions about what we're doing, but also can they come to us and, and the research that we're doing, can that help them? which is, again, one of the important and impactful things of 
why are they joined Flash Futures? Um, membership, how do we pay for all of this? This isn't a sales pitch, but if you do want to write me a check, I won't turn it down. Um, we needed to ensure when we had this membership approach that we covered the whole value chain. And that's about this technology push and pull. We need to ensure that when we talk about the technology pull and at the end users, they are pulling. They are pulling this you know, research that's coming from academia and research organizations. And we need to be that link that helps connect all of this. So when I show this slide, it's very busy. I get that. But what I like about this is it shows that we're not overrepresented one way or another. You know, we have, you know, obviously have more manufacturers, but we have an eclectic mix of brands, societies, academia, service providers. The whole value chain is represented here. And I think, you know, when we look at the brands, I think what's really interesting is that the, the pressure that they're putting on the manufacturers is like nothing I've seen before. You know, working for Sabic, you know, there was pressure from the brands, but Sabic always held the cards. In the glass industry, it's a complete other way around. There's huge pressure from the likes of Diageo and Heineken to turn around to these manufacturers and say, we're committing by 2025, we're going to put 50% recycled content in our bottles. Now, that's intense, and the manufacturers are kind of sat there going, we need help. So glass futures couldn't have happened at a, the more perfect time. So we're in collaboration with all of them, working on tons of projects that are going to help all of this come together. And kind of when we talk about paying for it, obviously it's great that we have all these members coming in. They have to get something in return. That's kind of it's, it's a no-brainer. No so we have four tiers of membership. Um, first one being for academia and NGOs, which we don't charge for. And then we have three paying tiers of membership. The top two tiers of membership are about £50,000 a year and £250,000 a year. But essentially what we do is we split that in half. Half of it goes into a strategic pot, as we call it, and that essentially covers the overheads of Glass Futures. And what that does is these big trial programs of work, so the first program that we're doing from June when we start right through for probably 18 months, it's going to all look at alternative fuels. All of our members are going to get access to that. Now, depending on what membership tier they are, depends on the level of access they get. But the top two tiers, the pot is split in half, and the second half of that goes into credits. They get credits to spend on research on individual projects. Now, it's my job to make sure that, you know, if member A and member B want to do the same thing, they pull together and they, their credits go further. But ultimately, what we're doing is we're giving the opportunity. I fully get, you know, Glass Future is operating in a pre-competitive space. is great, and it's a, it's a big dream that we can do it. But there's going to be some things that members want to use our furnace for for themselves. And giving them the opportunity to do that is really important. And I think that's why we went for this credit approach that allows members to use their allocation on their own thing. So if they want to hire the line out for a week, they can. And we need to build a schedule and a calendar that will allow that. And that will allow their access to that. So we've kind of built in that flexibility around how glass futures can be used. And I think that's a really important point. Um, this is a kind of nice slide to finish on. But one more slide after it. But yeah, so we talk about future of glass being collaboration. So when I talk about the the, the trial at NSG where they made forty percent lower embodied carbon, we actually used some of that glass in the windows in our building, which is a kind of really nice full circle story. Um, and we do believe that the future of glass is in collaboration. But um, my last slide, it's a bit of a very shameless plug, and I'm really sorry about this. But when we talk about the future, we're not the future anymore. You know, Amy, an old colleague of mine, we used to get called the future. The future of Sabic. We're not the future, we're the present. It's these young kids that are the future, they're the future of all of our industry. And I kind of really highly kind of stress the point that it's on us to make sure that the future of people want to come and be engineers or be chemists. And it's really important that we get into these schools and talk to them about the work that we all do because, you know, innovation is so needed in the UK and it's so slow. And these kids, they're the ones who are going to do it. And I truly believe that. And if you've enjoyed listening to me, I hope you have. Um, for some stupid reason, the Royal Society of Chemistry gave me some money to start a podcast with these two wonderful chemists that I know. Uh, it's called Periodic Fib. So if you want to listen to me harp on about chemistry and STEM, it's there. So yeah, um, that's it from me. I'm conscious of time for questions, but if you have any questions, please fire away at my email address is on the screen. So thank you. Well, first of all, 
Is there anybody in the room who has a question? And we'll come to people online shortly. Any questions in the room? Oh, sorry. Hiding the door. Hiding the door. Yeah, the last year, there would be something to share about this night. So, we just want some work to do all of this work. You draw the mention, you remember, company, so do you go out and hire what you have? Yeah, so we've, we've hired um, most of our own staff. Yeah, so it's um, it's grown from two people in 2020 to 50 people now with the plan to get to you know 100 people by operation. Um, the there's a big recruitment drive now, obviously recruiting glass for us operators, but we've we've worked closely with academia, so we've got a lot of our researchers from Sheffield. That's where a lot of our research team live because of the university and things there. But yeah, no, it's we've got some people who've worked for our member companies, but predominantly we've hired them all. Okay, uh, we had a question from uh, somebody online. If you could raise an electronic hand online, I'll mute you. Was it? It was Colin Farrell, is not there? He's left. Colin Woodward, sorry, beg your pardon. Do we have any questions online? Doesn't look like it. Sorry, did I see another hand? Uh, gentleman over there. Then you mentioned about fibre. There's a very high end side of fibre for communication. Yep. Are we a player in the UK in the yes. very high quality, high end side of that? Yeah, so we have, there's a company in Wigan that make high end fiber. We're having conversations with them, but they're part of the NSG group and NSG are one of our members. So it's, it's, it's a slightly niche area and the way that they make the fiber is slightly different, but those conversations are ongoing. And also, if, you know, recently there's been a really good publication on, which includes highlighting the shortage of high quality silica. And actually, a big part of the carbon footprint is going to be getting to the right kind of silicon for these particular specialist applications. Is that something in your research program as well? It's not in the research program as of yet. So, I mean, I have weird and wonderful conversations all the time. And I was having a conversation a few months back about doing chemical recycling of, you know, very broken down glass and turning it back into silica. I mean, I think that's, we're years off that. That's very low TRL stuff. Um, the glass industry, what, what we're seeing is there's a demand for increased PCR content. So we're looking at pullet, um, which is obviously the, the recycled glass. Um, pullet level will always be a challenge, I think, because there's a big demand for it and spreading it is is difficult. Um, recycling of glass in the UK is, is pretty good compared to the rest of the world. But if we can make that better, hopefully the demand on the sand will be lower. But yeah, it's it's not in the wheelhouse at the moment, but it's certainly, like you say, something that's it's definitely causing challenges for some of these higher end glass makers. Tony. Yeah, two questions around hydrogen. You mentioned um, you know, hydrogen is obviously key as, uh, as a replacement fuel, as it is in the steel industry. Have you, um, how, have you managed to source enough hydrogen? What, what you, how you get hold of it? And also, have you had any problems with the increased moisture content in your off gases and failure? So in terms of content, yeah, we've had tons of discussions with hydrogen suppliers. There was a few service providers. Um, we've got the contracts in place to get that bust in and to start with as we need it during the operation. It's going to come from, I believe it's coming in from um, just conventional PSR. So is there but, any pressure on the, from the industry to go the green hydrogen? I mean, the pressure's always there. I think we're here to demonstrate that the hydrogen works first. Yeah. We're having conversations. So I mean, as an example, St. Helens have ordered 12 hydrogen buses and haven't got hydrogen source. So it kind of makes sense using the land that, that we've got around Glass Futures if we can potentially. Did they? Yeah. 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 Because we don't actually need that much. I think it's about two tons per day we'd need. So it's not massive, um, but we are exploring that space. But the cost of, of building it is is pretty substantial. And obviously being a not for profit trying to run a glass plant um we can't spare that expense but if we can do it in partnership with government or other partners then we'd be more than willing to do it so uh, i see steve pallant has a question online steve yeah so 
a, uh, one of your members comes to you and asks you to do a trial, obviously they're going to ask you to do the riskier trials. How do you make sure it's not pushing the limits of your plan too much? And uh, you, how do you evaluate it whether you're going to do the trial? And is there a mechanism to say, no, that's too much on your, your precious new plant? Yeah, great question, Steve. Yeah, so we have what we have is we have uh, two inter well, two technical groups. We have our internal group, um, and then we have our external technical steering committee, which is made up of our kind of core members who've you know been around for for quite a while. And essentially, what what the remit of those groups is is to assess the scope of the projects that we can do, and sign them off. So essentially, the external group is the the kind of final group made up of um, the technical experts from you know our founding members as well as some of our higher paying members it's 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 their role to assess these projects and give them the kind of seal of approval as to whether it's going to kill the furnace or not based off of their experience now we are open to doing those kind of experiments but you know for instance hmm. if we were to do a borosilicate trial we wouldn't do that until the end so for everyone's reference borosilicate melts at high temperature so if we did that in the middle of the campaign we get contaminants, we're going to get unmelt because the borosilicate won't melt. So we have to make sure that those kind of trials that we do happen towards the end of the furnace's mm -hmm. life. But yeah, we do. We have two kind of, we have an internal and then an external mechanism that allow us to, to review those projects. Okay, thank you. Aaron, there's Steve sort of half asked a question about the environment. My, my questions are around risk as well because glass furnaces like steel furnaces and other types of furnaces they've, they've been designed to have a a quiet life a, a life where they do the same thing day in day out and the very nature of r d which which i know as well as anybody because i find in the r d facilities as well is is that you are wanting to flex that and do do all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful things so at the outset, you're building a really expensive facility and you're anticipating, you, you, you say you're going to run it for five or six years at the end of which it will have uh, worn itself out. If it only runs for 18 months, then that's a huge financial risk. So looking at the question I was going to ask is, you've got the small reheat facility at Brinsworth been working for a while now. Have you already learned lessons from that that have filtered into the design of the big facility at St. Helens? Yeah. So when we look at hydrogen, how hydrogen fires, so the, the furnace design, what we're going to do is going to be rear, um, rear fired. So essentially the batch will come in and the flame will come towards where the batch goes in. We've learned from the profile of how the hydrogen um, kind of is fired that we have to this I, i'm kind of trying not to get too technical because i don't know and you'll ask me horrible questions but essentially the, the kind of how we get the hydrogen mix right for the optimum combustion they're the kind of things that we've been looking at at brinsworth now my challenge on the comment about if, if the furnace does fail if it, if it breaks down in 18 months if we've gained enough research in that to demonstrate value you know 18 months okay that's a bit shorter than we'd like but you know if it runs for three years this furnace but we can hammer it and get tons of research on it i don't think that's a bad thing i think as long as the industry takes the learnings um yeah so so yeah we have we've had tons of learnings from a biofuels perspective from a hydrogen perspective the actual burner technology that we're going to use on the um, pilot facility itself um but it's also left some questions and answered so if you look at the refractory bricks with hydrogen we're they weren't impacted, but the colour of them was very different to how it would have been under natural gas. So there's there's lots of things coming from that side of things that are, are quite exciting to see how they react when the furnace is lit. So, Steve, do you have a question? Well, you've got one thing on top of you is going to, in a way, the collaborating but also competing. Yeah. So, how are you dealing with the uh, anti competition law and intellectual property? concerns of these companies they work together yeah it's fun <laughs> put it that way it's fun um, no it's very challenging and i think it's understanding why they're around the table and i think you know this is conversations i have with all the members certainly when they first come on board you know 
understanding the remit of what Glass Futures is, we try and operate in that pre-competitive space, but whenever these projects happen, we have to ensure that the collaboration agreements are, are rock solid. Um, it's understanding, you know, the levels of data that you're going to get per membership tier changes. Um, it, it is a big challenge, um, but ultimately it's, you know, if a member comes and wants to do their own project, you know, we ensure that that's covered within IP and antitrust and things like that. Um, it's a challenge, but if you come into Glass Futures, my argument is you know what you're doing. You understand the remit of, of the organization uh, and what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's certainly been a, a challenging one to kind of overcome, but I think it's that collaborative approach and ensuring that you know, the NDAs that we've got, the collaboration agreements that we've got are rock solid when it comes to explaining the nuances of the project. So, you know, the, there is going to be, you know, collaboration agreements for every project that we do, but, you know, if that's the way we have to do it, then so be it. Any more questions in the room? Oh, yes. Hopefully. So, yeah, yeah. So we have Magma Combustion who've been helping us, and then there was a few others. FIC do the whole electric aspect of things. So there's a few, there's a couple, but more. They're more using the glass industry, which is why we've got them involved. But, but yeah. Are there any questions online at all? Couldn't see any. So there's no hands up. No hands up. Right. Okay. Well, I think at that point, then, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll bring this uh, very interesting lecture to an end uh, and thank Callum again in the usual way. We also have a small gift for oh, it's you. Very kind of it's, quite quite oh. eh? it's quite important, isn't it? It's quite important, the gift. Yes, it is. It Don't there? drop it. Well, we'll yeah. find out what it is. <laughs> I'm going to have to open it. Class. Well, there we go. Oh, look at that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Very kindly. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you all for signing on. Um, much appreciated. So, uh, hope those of you who've signed in from the Midlands. Uh, there will be a recording available, um, so if you can get in touch via Ian Morris, uh, I can let you have the uh, address of our YouTube site where it will be posted. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you.